Welcome to this webinar entitled Certificate of Analysis Essentials for Regulated Bioanalysis. During the course of this webinar, we will address the following questions. What is a reference standard and why use one? Is a given reference standard appropriate for its intended use? What data does a reference standard certificate of analysis contain? How to interpret data from a certificate of analysis? And we will also address the case of large molecules, biotherapeutics, and peptides. Now, let's start with definition and purpose. A reference standard or reference material is a substance prepared for use as the standard in an assay, identification, or purity test. It should have a quality appropriate to its use. For example, for new molecular entities, a reference standard provided by a study sponsor can be appropriate. For preclinical studies, the quality and level of characterization of a reference standard depends on the stage of drug development. For example, at discovery stage, a reference standard may not be fully characterized. For regulated safety assessment studies, the use of reference materials characterized as per GLP regulations is required. For generation of bioequivalence PK quantitative data, the use of highly characterized reference standards is usual practice. Highly characterized high quality reference standards can come from different sources that should be authentic and traceable. Uh, first among those uh, are compendial sources that are recognized worldwide to meet requirements, such as the United States Pharmacopoeia, the European Pharmacopoeia, the Japanese Pharmacopoeia, uh, World Health Organization, and the National Institute of Standards and Technology. Other sources can be a qualified vendor with the appropriate expertise who synthesized and characterized the reference standard as per regulatory requirements. Uh, very often we refer to those as certified reference material or CRM. And another source can be a qualified vendor who completed the characterization of a reference standard that was synthesized by another supplier. In a regulated bioanalytical context, a reference standard allows for ensuring that the right compound is quantified, whether it's the administered drug, the active compound, or biomarker, and uh, it helps providing re reliable results with acceptable precision, accuracy, and reproducibility, uh, among others, through the use uh, of the standard in a calibration curve, such as the one illustrated here. It also helps ensure assay performance and overall high quality of the obtained data for decision-making purposes. And the other way reference standards can be used in a bioanalytical context is in quality control or QC samples that act as surrogate samples in the assay. How do we verify that a reference standard is appropriate for its intended use? FDA, EPA, and OECD GLP requirements for a test material include appropriate description of its identity, strength, purity, and composition. That information can all be found in the Material Certificate of Analysis, or C of A. For chemical compounds used as reference standards in regulated bioanalysis, a complete certificate of, anal of analysis provides evidence of identity so that the right compound will be quantified, including stereochemistry, if applicable. The quality so that the compound is suitable for its intended use. Uh, the assay and presence of impurity should be reported so that the physical properties of the reference standard are sufficiently described so that the compound weighing and solution preparation are reproducible. And this is all linked to the potency, which will be discussed a little bit later. And finally, stability to ensure proper handling and storage of the standard and minimize alteration of its original specifications. There are some particularities related to uh, non-clinical studies for test material and by extension uh, to reference materials that are different than for a uh, regular bioequivalence or bioavailability study. By EPA regulations, the characterization of a test material must be done before its use in a study. For the FDA, the characterization can be done after the study start date. Stability can be determined before study start, so before the protocol approval, or concomitantly according to written standard operating procedures. <laughs> 
The OECD only states that the test material characteristics should be known without any restrictions of time. So here is an example of a uh, typical case, uh, a reference standard for a new molecular entity that is not fully characterized was used for analytical method development for a non-clinical study, which is acceptable. At the time of method validation initiation, an updated C of A with a retest date, uh, which is different than an expiration date, of one year was provided by the study sponsor while the real-time stability was being assessed. Then in one year, the new updated stability will be used and put in the validation. Now let's look at the contents and interpretation of data in a certificate of analysis through a chemist's eyes. This here is a uh, prototype of the ideal C of A and the contents uh, it most often uh, should contain. So first is the supplier identification and contact information then the compound name and synonyms, the lot and or batch number, the molecular formula and weight, the compound structure, the shipping storage and handling information, identity and purity testing, isotopic purity that's applicable only for stable isotope label standards, uh, expiry date or retest date, and the authorized personnel signature and release date of the certificate of analysis. Now let's go through all of these items one by one and uh, figure out what they mean and what to look for. If there are discrepancies in the compound name in the bioanalytical method SOP versus the validation and or bioanalytical reports versus the certificate of analysis, then proper linking documentation should be included in the study file. So that's why it's important to have a look at the compound name and possible synonyms. For example, paliperidone is also known as 9-hydroxyrisperidone because it was discovered as a, a metabolite of paliperidone. In the uh, NIH PubChem website, you uh, will find that paliperidone is also known as 9-hydroxyrisperidone, but also as Invega 9-OH risperidone or Invega stena. The second example here is a mometazone. Mometazone is the active ingredient illustrated here on the left, whereas on the right you have the pro drug called mometazone furoate. The two compounds are different and have different molecular weights. So depending on the uh, administered compound in the study driving document, one or the other or both compounds may be required as reference standard for bioanalytical purposes. Now let's look at molecular formula and molecular weight. Uh, if details are available, uh, verify that the molecular formula and the weight are consistent with the mass spectrometric data in the certificate of analysis. Also, attention should be paid to free versus salt forms as this will impact potency calculation. So for example, on the left here, you have the structure of testosterone and next to it, you have the sulfate of testosterone, which in this case is a conjugate because there is a covalent bond between the alcohol group on the testosterone and the sulfur of the sulfate. Whereas for morphine, the free form is illustrated here and its sulfate this time is not a conjugate, but a salt. So for bioanalytical purposes, morphine and morphine sulfate uh, are the same when it comes to uh, especially mass spectrometric detection, they have the same mass that is observed in the assay. So it's important to figure out if the compound in the certificate of analysis is a uh, completely different compound such as testosterone and testosterone sulfate, or if they are equivalent such as in salt forms. If the structure is available, is it the right isomer? Comparison with literature may be possible also. So while we're talking about isomers, let's do a quick review of definitions. For enantiomers, there is one stereocenter and they are uh, it mirror images of each other and they are non-superimposable. So here on the left, you have eslicarbazepine, uh, which has the alcohol group in the back of the plane of the screen. It's an enzymer, r as has that same alcohol group in the front of the plane of the screen. 
For diastereomers, you need at least two stereo centers. Uh, the example here on the left is 1S, 2S pseudoephedrine, which has both alcohol and amine groups on the same side of the plane of the screen, which is the back side of the screen. Whereas the diastereomer 1R2S ephedrine has those two same groups on opposite sides of the plane of the screen. Cis or Z and trans or E isomers are also a different type of diastereomers. Uh, the example here on the left is trans E resveratrol, which has the two aromatic groups on opposite sides of the carbon-carbon double bond, whereas for cis-Z resveratrol, those two aromatic groups are on the same side of the carbon-carbon double bond. For regioisomers, they have the same functional group at different places on the structure, such as illustrated here for 2-hydroxyatorvastatin and 4-hydroxyatorvastatin. Now let's look at reference standard description storage and handling information on the certificate of analysis. An appearance that is different than indicated on the certificate of analysis can be indicative of possible decomposition or humidity absorption during shipping and or storage. So it's important to compare the information on the certificate of analysis and what you actually receive in your vial. Solubility information can be helpful in selecting the appropriate solvents for stock solution preparation. There may be some special storage conditions required, such as vacuum, inert atmosphere, usually nitrogen and argon are the most common. Uh, it can be stored over desiccant, especially if the compound is hygroscopic, as illustrated in the example here. Uh, different temperature requirements can be uh, uh, required for storage. And also, uh, if the compound is light sensitive, protection from light may be required during storage and or handling. Now let's switch to identity testing. To prove that the standard is the compound it is claimed to be, there are two main accepted analytical methods that provide information regarding the structure of the molecule of interest. The first one is uh, 1H NMR or proton NMR. It provides information of, on the number and position of hydrogen atoms on the molecule. The second technique is IR or FTIR, which provides information on the type of functionalities present on the structure. NMR stands for nuclear magnetic resonance. The principle of the technique is that electromagnetic radiation from a magnetic field can be absorbed by a spinning atom nucleus. The most common uh, nucleus that we look at is a hydrogen atom nucleus, which consists of a single proton or 1H. So the sample is put inside a, a large magnet that is the source of the electromagnetic radiation the frequency and intensity of the radiation absorption is detected and plotted into an NMR spectrum. The spectrum is characteristic of the nucleus and its environment. So for example, here uh, is the uh, proton NMR spectrum of ethanol. The proximity of nearby hydrogen atoms results in coupling between them and translates into multiple peaks in the spectrum. The position or chemical shift of the peak and its multiplicity give indications of where the hydrogen atom is situated on the structure of the compound and which functionality it is on or close to. So the chemical shift is the x-axis in the displayed NMR spectrum. And you can see that the uh, methyl group or CH3 of ethanol is uh, displayed as a triplet around one ppm. And it's a triplet because it's right next to a methylene group, the CH2, on the structure. Some important points to look at in a, a proton NMR spectrum. The solvent that was used in this case here for propranolol is a DMSO. Uh, the importance of the solvent is that because it can cause some shifting in the position of the peaks and also some shape of peaks, especially for exchangeable protons. And also we want to look at integration values. So for example, here in the spectrum for propranolol, um, the uh, peak around 7.0 ppm 
is integrated for 1.06, which means it corresponds to a single proton, and it was assigned to proton at position two of the aromatic ring of propranolol. If we were looking at the NMR uh, spectrum for propranolol D7, in which all the hydrogen atoms on the aromatic ring have been replaced by deuterium, and deuterium is not detected by proton NMR, then all the peaks in the region between 6.5 ppm to 8.5 ppm, which is the aromatic region, would disappear. There's possible impact on potency from the following information that can be extracted from an NMR spectrum. Are all peaks accounted for on the structure? So I, unidentified peaks may come from impurities, such as the ones circled here in the uh, uh, spectrum for tagged toxin. And if applicable, were isomers identified and quantified? Also, because maybe only one isomer has to be quantified in the assay. Um, here also uh, I included a, a useful reference for determining what are the common proton and carbon-13 NMR signals of solvents that can be present as impurities. Now let's switch to infrared spectroscopy. IR stands for infrared and FTIR stands for Fourier transform infrared. Both techniques are basically leading to the same result. The basic principle is that molecular bonds naturally vibrate. When a molecule is irradiated with infrared light, it absorbs it and the vibrations intensify. So the stretching, different kinds of stretching and rocking intensify. And that's a little bit like when you work out and you stretch and you move and then you heat up. And it's also the same principle that cooks your food inside your microwave oven. The level of absorption and the frequency of the absorbed radiation are translated into a spectrum, such as the one displayed here. The position, width, height, and shape of the peaks indicate what kind of functionalities are present on the molecular structure. In this case, uh, displayed here, the uh, very uh, sharp and intense peak at 1716 is indicative of a carbonyl compound. In this case, it's a ketone. Um, now let's broach the topic of mass spectrometry or MS. For certificate of analysis purposes, high resolution mass spectrometry is often performed. The mass spectrometric data in itself is not a proof of identity, but can support NMR or FTIR data. The principle is that inside the mass spectrometer, there is a strong electric field that is applied to the sample and that produces molecular ions that are usually positively charged. So the molecular ion is referred to as M plus H because you add a, a proton or a hydrogen and that leads to the positive charge. And that is what is detected inside the mass spectrometer. Negative mode is also possible for compounds that easily ionize to an anion. So for example, carboxylic acids. Here is an example of HRMS uh, spectrum of a compound. Uh, here it is testosterone, which has an exact mass of 288.21. So the molecular uh, ion should have a mass plus one. The theoretical calculated value is 289.2168. And from the spectrum, we can see that the uh, experimental value is 289.2168. 2162, which is within the acceptable 10 ppm difference that is typical for HRMS. Now, if we were to look at the HRMS of a stable isotope labeled compound, here exemplified by testosterone D3, once again, the uh, experimental value is within the acceptable uh, 10 ppm difference uh, with the theoretical value, but most importantly, there is no unlabeled testosterone that is observed, which was 289 from the previous mass spectrum. Now let's take a look at the purity testing and the different techniques that are used for impurity determination. So a combination of several techniques are used to determine the level of impurities, and all of that helps in the potency calculation. 
Usually an HPLC chromatogram should be present or HPLC results should be reported on the certificate of analysis. The presence of other tests depend on the supplier, the internal SOPs of the bioanalytical laboratory and the scope of the study. So HPLC stands for high performance liquid chromatography. It is used to determine the proportion of material that is the desired compound. It can detect isomers, such as regioisomers or diastereomers that we discussed before. If the compound has one stereocenter and a chiral column is used, then enantiomers can be separated. Uh, also, as a note, thin layer chromatography or TLC is not a quantitative method for purity determination and is not recommended for accurate potency calculation. So here is an example of an HPLC chromatogram. Uh, here you can see the main component, which is delta-9 THC. Some uh, impurities, including a, the regioisomer delta-H, uh, delta-8 THC uh, was uh, detected and other impurities as well, other cannabinoids. And uh, one thing of note here is that since there were a lot of impurities that were expected lots of regioisomers and other, um, in, especially in the case of natural compound isolation issues, uh, you have better chance of a good separation from these impurities with a longer runtime. Uh, for enantiomers, since we uh, talked about it a little bit earlier, here is an example of um, HPLC chromatograms for a racemic compound, which is at the bottom here, for R and S propranolol. And then you have the enantio enriched R propranolol at the top and in the middle, enantio enriched S propranolol. If both enantiomers are detected, then enantiomeric purity can be calculated and reported on the certificate of analysis. The water content, or WC, is uh, very often performed for reference uh, standard material. It is usually performed by Carl Fisher colometry using an instrument such as the one displayed here on the right. Uh, and the average of two to three measurements is usually reported as a percentage as displayed in the example here. OVI, or organic volatile impurities, is also called residual solvent analysis. It is usually performed by GCFID, which is flame ionization detection. And you can see in the example here that some dichloromethane was detected as an impurity in the reference standard. The percentage of a residual solvent in the standard can also be determined through proton NMR if the solvent has some detectable protons. Loss on drying, or LOD, is uh, determined using a moisture scale, such as the one displayed here on the right. It consists of weighing a sample, then drying it for several hours, and then weighing it again. The difference between the two weights determines the amount of water and other volatiles present in the material. A residue on ignition, or ROI, is also called microash analysis or sulfated ash. It is used to determine the inorganic content in a standard. For example, if the compound is in the form of a sodium salt or simply other inorganic impurities. ICPMS can also be used to determine trace elements such as lead or palladium and other possible metal contaminants that, uh, for example, may come from the synthesis of the compound. Iron, iron content is uh, usually determined by ion chromatography. The results are important if the standard is under a salt or bound form due to possible impact on potency calculation. In the example here, the results are within the specifications of between 15 to 17 percent. If a result is lower than the specifications, then it could indicate a mixture of free and salt forms. If a result is higher than the specifications, it would indicate the presence of salt impurities. Elemental analysis, also called CHN analysis, determines the percentage of carbon, C, hydrogen, H and nitrogen N in the standard. 
If the compound is under a bound or salt form, elemental analysis results can confirm that information. So several techniques can be used to corroborate each other and give more information overall on a reference standard. If more impurities are present, then uh, there will be a greater difference between the theoretical value and the experimental value reported on the certificate of analysis. In the example here, both values are uh, pretty much uh, within specifications. Now let's talk about internal standards in regulated bioanalysis. From the draft ICH M10 guidance, when MS detection is used, the use of the stable isotope labeled analyte as the internal standard or IS is recommended whenever possible. It is essential that the labeled standard is of high isotopic purity and that no isotope exchange reaction occurs. The presence of unlabeled analyte should be checked and if unlabeled analyte is detected, the potential influence should be evaluated during method validation. So that information uh, usually is reflected in certificate of analysis through isotopic purity and distribution. One of the two is usually reported examples of both are uh, illustrated here. It's only for stable isotope labeled internal standards. And if both values of purity and distribution are reported and corroborate each other, then there is no expected impact on the potency. Uh, the uh, isotopic distribution is often determined by um, monitoring the different masses of all the different deuterated species such as illustrated here on the right. And then the, uh, all the values can be expressed as relative percentage, such as in the small table here on the left. More importantly, there is a minimal amount of D0 in this standard. And that is recommended in order to avoid interference in a uh, bioanalytical assay. Several deuterated species are observed in this mass spectrum display here on the right. An impact of, on potency is expected since the relative percentage of the compound D6 that is to be used as internal standard will be low as compared to all the other species present in the reference standard. The optical rotation is a qualitative data for enenso enriched compounds only. For the nomenclature, if the compound is known as plus something, dextro or uh, lowercase d, the result of optical rotation should be positive. Conversely, if the compound is minus something, levo or lowercase l, the value should be negative. The absolute value itself depends on the concentration and the solvent used, which is why it's usually reported such as the example presented here. Now let's talk about potency calculation. Potency is also called mass balance purity factor. The potency reflects the proportion of the reference standard powder that actually contains the analyte. So we're looking at the mass of the free form. It ensures reliable weighing for stock solution preparation to be used in a calibration curve and or quality control samples. The HPLC purity is corrected for the impurities that cannot be detected accurately by HPLC UV. So there's the water content either by WC or LOD and other residual solvents through OVI, salts, inorganic contents, or R that is determined through ROI, uh, other uh, isomers or solvents that could be detected by NMR and so on. Then potency is calculated using the following formula. So it's correction of the HPLC purity with all the impurities. And then there is a possible correction with the uh, total or bound molecular weight if applicable. So let's look at some examples. Here we have data for compound X with a molecular weight of 285.34 and it's under a free form. The HPLC purity is 99.4%. There is no residual solvent detected, 
uh, water content is 0.36% and the inorganic content is less than 0.2%, so is quite negligible in this case. So the pot potency could be calculated as follows for a result of 99.0% potency. In the second example here, you have a data for levothyroxine sodium salt. Um, you have the HPLC purity that's 98.6%, there's water content of 2.7%, uh, OVI is negligible, and of note is that the iron content result of 3.1% are within the specifications. So it's really a one-to-one -one ratio of uh, levothyroxine carboxylate ion to sodium ion then the potency would be calculated as illustrated here at the bottom. So the HPLC purity corrected for impurities, and then there's the correction of the um, bound molecular weight versus uh, the um, molecular weight of just levothyroxine uh, in its neutral form. And that leads to a potency of 93.2%. Now let's talk about large molecules. By definition, they usually have a molecular weight of more than one kilo Dalton, but there can be some exceptions depending on the structure of the molecule. The increased complexity of large molecule structures as compared to smaller drug compounds makes their characterization a very demanding process. Biologics may be heterogeneous and their potency and immunoreactivity may vary from one lot to another. Different criteria for the re reference standards will apply, and that's also reflected in the applicable guidances. Depending on standard operating procedures applicable at a bioanalytical site, the following situations may apply. Uh, for biosimilars, the marketed product or a different lot of the standard can be used for comparison purposes. If a detailed certificate of analysis is not available, then a material safety data sheet, which is MSDS or SDS, providing information about storage, formulation, and preparation of the biological standard would be an asset. For new molecular entity biotherapeutics, a reference standard can be sourced from the study sponsor and its certificate of analysis accepted as is on a case-by-case -case basis. For small proteins and surrogate peptides, a synthetic reference standard may be available commercially. So a surrogate peptide is used when sample processing involves digestion, usually using an enzyme. It's when the intact parent cannot be quantitated as a whole. So then the concentration of the surrogate peptide reflects the concentration of the intact parent in the sample. So for example, hypothetical example with human insulin, if we're looking at the surrogate peptide that's circle in green here, it corresponds to the following structure. So it's a small peptide of molecular weight 942.02 mass units. The interpretation of the data from identity and purity tests that are routinely done for small molecules is considered considerably more complex for larger structures. For example, proton NMR, especially when we looked at the structure we just saw for that hypothetical uh, surrogate peptide structure for insulin. The tests usually performed for peptidic standards synthesized by specialized vendors are the following. For identity, usually there's mass spectrometry, amino acid analysis, and some tests to confirm the presence of uh, salt forms or counter ions. Peptide mapping can also be included. For purity, usually HPLC and or peptide content are performed and water content can also be reported. If information is missing or unavailable, such as expiration or retest date or identity testing, then some proper documentation such as a deviation with justification is advisable. Here is an example of a uh, mass uh, spectrum of a uh, small peptide. In the case of peptides, because the structure is so large, it could actually be ionized or charged or more than one position. Then we have to consider multiple charged states. For example, for a peptide with an exact mass of 
since the MS is reported as mass over charge, then its plus three uh, charge state would be uh, detected as a, a theoretical value calculated by the molecular ion, so the mass plus one, which is in this case uh, 3753.53 plus the charge, so plus three, and then divided by the charge, three. So that leads to a theoretical value of 1,251.84. And in the spectrum display here on the right, we can see that the experimental result is 1,251.53, which is within the acceptable uh, margin of 0.1% of the theoretical value. Amino acid analysis, or AAA, confirms the number of amino acids of each kind present in the peptide. It involves hydrolysis of the peptide. Uh, AAA results do not confirm the peptide sequence. It's only the uh, different types of amino acids contained in the sample. And it re the results are usually reported as an average of duplicate analysis. Um, one important thing about amino acid analysis is that the hydrolysis, uh, it converts asparagine to aspartic acid and glutamine to glutamic acid. Serine, uh, threonine are partially destroyed during hydrolysis, while cysteine, methionine, and tryptophan are completely destroyed. So in the case of the hypothetical surrogate peptide we saw earlier for um, insulin, which has the following uh, structure and sequence, you can see that as expected, uh, we expect two leucines and two tyrosines, which are both reported uh, results as about two. And the um, asparagine is detected as aspartic acid, and the glutamine and glutamic acid are both reported as glutamic acid, which is a result of 2.07. The peptide content is uh, calculated from elemental analysis through nitrogen content, and it's expressed as a percentage. It can also be calculated from amino acid analysis, and the peptide content includes peptidic or amino acid impurities. It's usually reported uh, as a percentage here, as you can see uh, at the top. Uh, the peptide content is already corrected for water content and the presence of a counter ion. So, for example, if the peptide is a, in the form of a TFA salt. In that case, the potency can be calculated as follows for peptides packaged as gross weight. So, the purity is multiplied by peptide content and that leads to potency. Now, the take-home message for this webinar is that reference standards are central to regulated bioanalysis. The characteristics and level of certification of a reference standard depend on its intended use and the stage of drug development the study is in. It is in the best interest of industry partners and reference standard suppliers to work together to adapt reference material quality and the corresponding certificate of analysis, depending on needs and regulatory requirements throughout a drug development program. And finally, proper understanding of the information on a certificate of analysis can prevent costly mistakes. Thank you for watching.